Kia ora koutou katoa. I'm Catherine Marshall, co-chair of the Governing Board, and uh, along with Tracy Howe, uh, we're really delighted to welcome you here to our very um, special annual general meeting for 2020. This is the second only uh, virtual AGM that we're holding, and uh, we're delighted that you've joined us. Um, in fact, we've got uh, 593 people registered to uh, join this meeting today and um, 97 people have already started voting. So I think we're in for uh, a nice couple of, um, well, an hour and a half. And uh, what we'd like to do is to try and uh, update you on all the things that have been happening in the last year, but also bring in um, a sense of celebration of the things that have been achieved. Uh, by individuals as well as groups. So um, in the next slide, I'd just like to let you know that um, what we're doing is with the um, GoToWebinar, this is how it's going to operate. We're going to um, invite you to submit questions as you go along. Tracy and I can see the questions um, that pop up and we'll answer those at the end. Someone has just asked how to vote. Um, and uh, we're going to have um, a little button that appears on the screen uh, that will tell people how to vote. Um, so I'm thinking that that should just pop up automatically there, Ray. Um, the next screenshot um, will tell you that uh, we are operating. Oh, sorry. The annual general meeting um, is a chance for you to get to meet us and the other senior officers of. Um, Cochrane and it's going to give you a chance to make some uh, resolutions on key issues that we've got to uh, put to you and those are resolutions and that's going to be quite a formal part of the um, AGM but we are hoping to have some fun as well. If we move to the next slide um, you'll see that um, there are there have been significant um, changes for every charity um, operating under UK rules this year and um, the UK Charity Commission has allowed organisations to hold their annual general meetings online up until the 20th of December. So um, that's the, the operating framework that we're, oper that we're working under and you'll see that we're also hoping to make changes to our Articles Association to allow us to run these virtual meetings um, on a more frequent basis. In the next slide, um, I'll just give you an outline of what we're going to cover over the next hour and a half. Um, and I'll talk through the um, AGM voting procedures and I'll talk to you about the trustees. Um, so here's some more information. Um, the voting is electronic and you must have access to an internet connected device to vote. And you can vote at any time. Um, hopefully you can all log on to agm.cochran.org and put in your Archie um, account details and that will let you vote. So I'm hoping that's going to be pretty painless for everyone. I voted earlier, so um, I'm hoping that you find it okay. Um, now, while you can see Tracy and I here, uh, there are a um, lot of really great people behind us on the governing board um, and uh, this is a quick snapshot of the people who have been working enthusiastically on the board um, for you. Uh, as you see we come from 10 different countries and um, range from Argentina to New, to New Zealand. Uh, and on the next slide um, we'd like to uh, just explain that while we have board meetings, we also do quite a lot of work outside of those meetings. And we have a range of committees that we've set up to look at everything from strategy to how we run new events and colloquia. We look um, at the finance and audit um, and investment activities of the um, organisation. We also have a very active governance committee. So um, there's quite a lot of work um, that we have in a traditional um, sense for a, a normal go governing board. And in the last few months, we've also started a diversity and inclusion program. Tracy's going to talk to you a little bit more about that uh, in the next few minutes. 
on the next slide, um, we've just summarised quickly the legal duties that each governing board member has. And um, our obligations are to act in the charity's best interest. So what we do is um, we need to think uh, about the organisation and we need to make sure that we don't have any personal conflicts of interest and that's something that we take very seriously. Um, we have a responsibility to make sure that the charity is uh, going to thrive in the long term and so it has to have the resources um, that it needs to operate in a sustainable way. And we need to act with reasonable care and skill ensuring that our financial and legal obligations um, as employers and as um, a business um, meet all the UK government requirements. That means we also have to have quite formal financial and statutory reporting and uh, we're also required to have an AGM each year. So um, there's actually quite a structure that supports the um, Cochrane organisation and um, this is uh, some of the expectations of board members. In the next slide, um, we would like to particularly pay tribute and thanks to um, three special people who have been helping us over the last few years. Um, many of you who joined the last virtual AGM will have met uh, Martin Burton. He has been um, the, the co-chair uh, for the last AGM and um, we are missing him, but I'm sure he's logged on online um, and it's very nice for him to have um, uh, worked with us over the last few years. And Jan Clarkson and Gladys Faber Beaumont have recently just um, resigned. Their terms as trustees have um, ended and they've both made tremendous contributions. So we'd like to uh, especially record our thanks for them. Um, we've also been delighted to welcome two new members, sorry, three new members to um, the board. Uh, you're going to be meeting Karen Kelly from Scotland um, in the next few minutes. Karen is the new treasurer and uh, Juan Franco from Argentina and Tamara Credo from South Africa have also recently joined us. So um, it's been really nice to have um, their enthusiasm for the uh, board work. Um, we have to formally appoint um, Tracy and Karen as trustees. And so, um, Myself and Sally Green have proposed uh, their appointment and we'd like to invite you to vote now. Okay, I'm hoping that the voting's working out well. Uh, I haven't got any, any comments. So um, one of the things that uh, Tracy and I talked about when we were planning this AGM was that uh, we didn't want this to be too dry. We wanted to add some um, real excitement. Uh, we think it's exciting um, to the throughout the AGM, and for you to hear from people who have done fabulous things over the year. And so we're going to be interspersing the prizes and awards throughout this meeting. And it is my delight to uh, first introduce the Kenneth Warren Prize. And this is the, um, goes to the principal author of a systematic review published in the Cochrane Library by a national living in a lower or middle income country that is judged to be both of high methodological quality and relevant to the health problems in lower or middle income countries. And uh, I'm delighted to announce that Nishant Jasval has been the winner of this and um, he's going to talk to us now. Good morning everybody, this is Dr. Nishant and I would like to thank the Ken Warren Prize Committee and the Cochrane Collaboration for choosing our review uh, to receive the prize, and the prestigious prize and the, uh, as, a, as a lead author and uh, I am very humbled and honoured to receive, uh, receive this prestigious prize. And also, uh, uh, on behalf of the whole author team, I would like to thank the uh, Ken Warren Prize Committee and the Cochrane Collaboration, and also the Cochrane Developmental Psychosocial and Learning Problems Group. It's great. Thank you very much, Nishant. 
um, for making the little video clip. I think it's really nice to see you. Um, now, uh, we've just got a question from Mike Clark. Um, you can vote uh, one item at a time if you want to, but you can also vote um, uh, for all of the items um, if you'd like to. So it's your call. Uh, so I'm over to the minutes. And uh, the minutes are from the last AGM. And uh, if we just move to the vote, um, you'll see that they're on the AGM website. Um, and we invite you, myself and Ray Lamb, to vote on approving those minutes. Um, thanks, Elizabeth, for that note uh, about the, um, the minutes. We'll certainly pick that up. Okay, thanks very much. Um, the next um, part of the um, meeting is going to be led by Tracy. Uh, she's going to present the co-chair's report. So over to you, Tracy. Thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever everyone is. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to present the co-chair's report on behalf of myself uh, and Catherine and, of course, uh, the rest of the board. This year has been really defined by the pandemic. Um, everyone's life has been touched by this uh, in many ways. And um, as the pandemic emerged in March, uh, the Cochrane community uh, swiftly came together to respond, uh, as Cochrane do uh, in times of uh, crisis. Um, so the response from the community was rapid and multifaceted. We saw the uh, Cochrane uh, citizen scientist team uh, coming together um, in Cochrane crowd, uh, providing fantastic support. Um, we produced the, uh, the COVID-19 study register and many people brought uh, their voices and enthusiasm and expertise together uh, across the world. So um, thank you so much to everyone there. Many of this, uh, these activities have been uh, presented uh, as uh, case studies that you can find available on the Cochrane.org website. And these are examples from around the world. So um, from our Cochrane groups, our Cochrane centres, uh, geographic centres, uh, fields uh, and methods teams. So please do go and visit these and look at the fantastic work that everyone has been doing. So there are lots of case studies and stories there. The Cochrane community um, obviously had to adapt to their working environments. Uh, many people working from home and people sent in images from around the world showing us their new ways of working, uh, which as you can see were very varied um, and some people were very innovative in terms of how they came together to, to work in uh, difficult situations. And this, of course, included the board. We were unable to meet together as we would normally do at uh, colloquia and uh, governance uh, meetings. So we were adapted to our virtual working environment. Um, here you can see one of our board meetings. So <clears throat> the key roles of the board during the pandemic were to ensure that the charity itself remained viable. So it was looking internally to make sure that uh, we were able to continue business as usual, um, but also ensuring that we continue to work to serve the public who are our beneficiaries. So looking externally to ensure that our work was focused on uh, ensuring that we were providing uh, evidence that was uh, applicable, um, particularly in the pandemic situation. So what did we do here? We worked with the chief executive and the editor in chief to make sure that all the business con continuity plans were put in place. We looked at the uh, 
impact the pandemic might have on our revenue for sales of licenses to the Cochrane Library as resources have been diverted um, around the world into uh, different priorities. Uh, and of course the organisation's reputation here, um, which the community did a fantastic job of uh, producing uh, evidence uh, specifically for the pandemic. Uh, we reviewed the feasibility of continuing uh, to plan for large face-to-face -face meetings, which of course now are more difficult to do. Um, and we had the 2020 and 2021 governance meetings and of course the, the colloquia in uh, Toronto and of course we're very much looking forward to the Global Evidence Summit in 2021. So difficult decisions to, to manage here. And we also looked at different ways that we can build online collaboration across the community during the pandemic and of course um, beyond into 2021 looking at how we can continue to engage with our community uh, in constructive ways. Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, unfortunately, we had to make the decisions to postpone the Cochrane uh, Colloquium in Toronto uh, and the Global Evidence Summit. So they, they aren't cancelled, they're postponed. Um, we're very sad that we had to do that, but um, situation as it was, we were unable to, um, to meet face to face. So, um, moving on to significant achievements across the organisation, um, we thank people, our Cochrane community, you are a fantastic community, we are so proud to be able to be part of this community um, and we, we appreciate all of the work that many people around the world have done. Again, if you look at the Cochrane.org, uh, there are hundreds of stories of success and innovation. Um, we're a fantastic community, um, so innovative, enthusiastic. Please go and read some of the stories. They're amazing. Um, you're amazing people. Thank you. So um, there are individual stories here, and it's lovely to be able to show these. Um, we've got a thriving international community, um, which is part of our uh, uh, our purpose is looking at diversity um, and this includes uh, our Cochrane Early Career Professionals who I think there are around 900 people engaged in that and that's fantastic because um, we have to ensure uh, uh, the next generation of leaders um, are adequately supported so thank you to, to them and all of the people that are providing assistance and support to, to, to that group. Um, <clears throat> So what have the board been doing uh, over the last year? Um, well, uh, we've been uh, engaged in the uh, discussions and decision making around the publishing co contract for the Cochrane Library, which you um, are aware uh, was awarded to John Wiley and Sons. Um, it was a very intensive pro process and thanks very much to the CET who were um, leading the discussions and negotiations on that. And we're pl pleased to report that we have uh, improved financial terms, which gives some more uh, predictable income for the uh, Cochrane. Uh, it's a um, flexible uh, customising publishing platform and the opportunity to use uh, publishing standards and technologies. And we have a commitment to streamlining and improving the speed and accuracy and predictability of, of content. So well done to everyone involved in that process. The other uh, large uh, area of activity, as you know, is that Strategy 2020 comes to an end. Um, so we've been working uh, as a board and with the CET to develop the new um, strategic framework for beyond 2020. And this is the current draft of the framework. Many of you will have already seen this and have been able to provide feedback. So we've been soliciting feedback from uh, uh, all the Cochrane uh, groups and centres. Um, and these uh, uh, are here and you'll be seeing more of that into 2021. And we're pleased to announce that um, we have just started a new diversity and inclusion programme and one of the first uh, 
things that you will see is a project looking at uh, how diverse the community is to look at to understand people's experiences of engaging uh, with Cochrane from an inclusivity perspective uh, and how we enable our beneficiaries to participate in the production of the reviews uh, that affect them. Uh, and important, we're looking at barriers and enablers to creating a more diverse and inclusive Cochrane community. So the first uh, project should develop a series of recommendations for the uh, organisation uh, and outline um, metrics and other measures that we can communicate the progress on this. So an exciting project. So uh, all that's left for me to say is thank you. Uh, we are missing our face-to-face -face meetings. Um, we always uh, love to talk to people individually. Uh, Catherine and I will be setting up a series of uh, coffee meetings where you can come online and have a virtual coffee with us uh, so that you can meet us um, not face to face but virtually uh, and we would like to hear your suggestions uh, on how else we may be able to keep uh, the community connected and you can keep up with our board activities of course on the Cochrane community website uh, all the papers and things are there so thank you very much and i um, hand back over to Catherine. Thanks very much Tracy um, and uh, Yes, as Tracy said, thanks to everyone, and we'll have a chance to um, repeat that again. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to um, our new treasurer, Karen Kelly. Um, over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, and hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to briefly report on the financial statements for 2019 and provide an update on the current year and also a look forward to, to next year. So starting with 2019, this is a, a very brief summary of our financial statements. And you'll see here that in 2019, we had income of 8.1 million and expenditure of 9.2. So we did have an operating deficit last year of 1.1 million. We've shown the figures uh, there for 2018, but I actually think um, the better comparison is with the budget for 2019, because when, when the budget was set, it was intended that there would be an operating deficit of 1.7 million. So actually the outturn is a much improved position. And that left us with reserves at the end of 2019 of 6.1 million pounds. And you can actually see the full statutory accounts at the at the website there i'm certainly not intending to go through all of those today um i'll move on now to 2020 which we're of course we're now we're now nearly at the end of it now there were two key factors um which impacted on on 2020 and tracy's already made reference to to these and and they made a very different year from a financial perspective as well so firstly, there was a new publishing contract with Wiley, and that's based on an income sharing arrangement, which provides a guaranteed level of income annually to the organisation. And there was also a significant signing bonus, which will add to the reserves of, of the organisation. And you'll see as I go through that that will help to support strategic investment in the organisation. In relation to uh, the, the COVID-19 impact, as Tracy said, it's led to postponement of, of initiatives and there was a need to redirect resources to uh, enable the response to, to COVID. But pleased to say that most of the targets and priorities have been met. So our forecast at the moment as we approach the end of 2020 is to um, have an, an overall surplus of of 4.2 million, much of that is because of the signing bonus, um, but there will be a, a small operating deficit of 0.3 million, which again is a much improved position from the budget that was set for this year, where we intended that there would be an operating deficit of 2 million. So we are actually looking at substantial reserves at the end of this year of 10.3 million pounds. 
So now looking at the 2021 outlook. Um, so because of the impact of COVID, we are likely to see a downward pressure next year and beyond. But we now have the security of a minimum level of income from uh, the, the new publishing arrangements. And the next slide will actually show this um, diagrammatically so we can we can see here the, the, the blue line is the overall earnings and uh, the red line is our share that we get from royalties. So, so we can see that that has had an up, upturn in 2020, but we do expect that that will that will come down next year um, and perhaps not seeing a recovery for a while. It's all very uncertain, but we're keeping a close eye on that. So, um, so I've mentioned the COVID impact and the contractual safeguards. So the board has considered these factors very carefully um, in setting our budget for 2021, which we just agreed yesterday at our board meeting. And we've considered the importance of investing in our key priorities. Um, so given our reserve situation, the, the board has agreed a deficit budget of £2 million for next year in order to protect the priorities and take the time now to create a sustainable base for, for the future. So what does that look like? The 2021 budget, we are projecting income of £8 million, which is a 12% reduction compared to 2020, and that is mostly due to our publishing income. Um, but to, to try to offset that, we've increased our, our fundraising targets, and indeed we'll be looking at a fundraising strategy next, early next year. Expenditure budget is £10.1 million. Um, that is an increase of 7%, but it does include significant investment in a new review production model. So we're looking at a, an operating deficit for next year of £2.1 million um, and looking at our, our reserves to, to support that. So looking specifically at our, our reserves, we're projecting free reserves at the end of 2020 of £5.8 million, um, of, of which we think it would be prudent to maintain £2 million in, in perpetuity. So £3.8 million is available to support Cochrane through a period of transition and uncertainty to a new sustainable operating model by 2024. So my last slide uh, with that in mind is just to set out what that reserves policy is. Um, and the, the board has agreed to this policy. It's a risk-based policy. And what we are looking at of our 10.3 million reserves, which we're projecting at the end of this year, we're going to set aside £2 million as a continuity fund, and that's to um, support us through a period of transition. A fund of £2.5 million, which will support specific investments, specific um, projects, which the board will consider individually before re releasing those reserves. And then of the free reserves, we have £3.8 million, which we are earmarking support to support our transition to a sustainable model and that will be perhaps the main business of the finance audit and investment committee over the course of 2021 supporting the central executive team in developing that that plan and that maintains our free reserves floor of of two million pounds and that's it these are substantial sums that the organisation has. So it's important that we make sure that those funds are properly protected and that they maintain their value. So the intention is to develop a new funds investment policy in 2021. That concludes the Treasurer's report. Cheers. Thanks very much, Karen. I think it's really helpful to have that explained so clearly. 
Um, uh, Lucy, can we go to the next slide and invite people to um, receive and note the trustees report and financial statements for 2019? If you could vote now, that would be great. Um, I'd like to now move on to the next prize, the Bill Silverman Prize. Um, and this prize is offered annually and explicitly acknowledges Cochrane's value of criticism with a view to helping to improve its work and thus achieve its aim of helping people make well-informed decisions about healthcare by providing the best possible evidence on the effects of healthcare interventions. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Livia Puljak, who is the um, recipient of this prize. Congratulations, Livia, and over to you with the video. I was very proud and honored when I got the news that our publication got the Bill Silverman Prize for 2020. I'm also immensely proud of our research team, and I would like to thank colleagues Ognjen Barčot, Matija Boric, Svetlana Doshenovic, Tina Poklepovic Pericic, and Maria Chavar for participating in this study and making it happen. I'm truly impressed that Cochrane is recognizing the value of criticism coming from methodological studies, also called research on research studies or meta research studies. In my personal experience, such studies are often underappreciated and disregarded as not a real research. However, I never let such comments discourage me. Constructive criticism of research practices is the way forward, enabling learning and improvement. If we do not take a step back to analyze what we do, how we do it, and how we can improve it, we will never make a progress. Thank you, Cochrane, for this award. Thank you very much, Livia. Okay, um, I'd like to move on to the adoption of the revised articles of association. Um, we've got a slide here. Um, Lucy, before we vote, um, there's, uh, I'm trying to multitask and uh, find an answer to one of the questions that Eric von Elm has asked about the um, um, article which uh, relates to the term for appointed governing board members. Um, they, it is the same term, three years, in two lots of three years, uh, but I can't quickly put my finger on the um, exact article. Um, Lucy, can you do that? Uh, I can. I can do that, but not right now, Catherine, because I'm sharing the screen, but I can go and look to the exact article. The The change being proposed is is um, only to allow anybody that has been appointed as co-chair to complete their term as chair rather than having to step down because of the maximum six year term. But in general, the the term of three plus three years still remains the same. Thanks very much, Lucy. So um, we're not proposing wholesale changes to the um, articles of association, um, and there are just a few um, small areas that we want to um, uh, improve the um, consistency of the articles so that they're uh, more in line with um, standard operating approaches for other UK charities, and we've um, taken advice on this. Uh, so we're looking at more flexibility on holding virtual AGMs like this, um, looking at improving the rules for electing and appointing governing board members uh, and absolutely declaring interests um, and any conflicts. And then we've got a few minor uh, tweaks and corrections and updates. Um, so now I'd like to um, uh, invite you to vote. I hope you've all had a chance to look at the website where there's quite a lot of information about the articles and I um, invite you to vote. Thank you. Okay, um, we have one other formality to um, uh, conduct, and that is the appointment of the auditors. 
Uh, we have been using Saya Vincent as auditors uh, for the last few years, and they've been very um, constructive and helpful uh, in um, helping us uh, review our accounts, and we'd like to continue to work with them. Um, so we propose reappointing them for another year, and we'd invite you to vote on that. Thank you very much. Now um, we have another award, and this is the Anne Anderson Award. Um, I'm sorry that we're not going to be celebrating Anne's achievements through a walk together, um, but uh, as we would normally at a colloquium, but um, Anne was generous enough to give this award to a Cochrane contributor who has meaningfully promoted women as leaders and contributors to Cochrane. And uh, it is my great pleasure to say that the recipient of 2020 is Sophie Hill. Um, congratulations, Sophie, and we have a video um, to play. Hello, everyone. I can't tell you how proud I feel to receive this award. Supporting women has just been part of my life, and so to receive an award for this is a really special moment. I want to thank my nominees and thank Cochrane that's been such an incredible part of my life for the past 20 years. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you very much, um, Sophie, and uh, thank you very much for your um, uh, putting together a little video. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to Miranda Langdon, who is the uh, one of the co-chairs of the Cochrane Council. And uh, Miranda, I would like you to um, uh, provide the um, council report. Thank you, Catherine. Um, hello, everybody. Hello from the Netherlands. Um, I would like to give a brief report of the work of the council. And of course, I do that on behalf of all council members. So we are with, um, um, we represent uh, eight groups. Those are the authors, the information specialists, the coordinating editors, managing editors, fields, geographic groups, methods groups, and consumers uh, network. Um, we have meetings, of course, uh, virtual meetings, uh, but we also are involved in many of the working groups that, um, that Catherine uh, presented uh, earlier. Uh, the aim and purpose um, of the Council is that we want to assure that the groups retain an effective voice in Cochrane's leadership and strategic decision making. So we are the voice of the community. Um, and the purpose of the Council is to, um, to consider high level matters affecting Cochrane as a whole. And that is in, in two ways you could say it is to raise matters and provide input to the governing board on behalf of the groups, but also to consider matters at request of the board. Um, the key activities in 2020 um, was that we uh, prepared uh, a climate change paper with the title Responding to Climate Change as an Organization. You will find it uh, on our website and of course we submitted that paper to the board. Um, we developed a council communications strategy and provided input to the knowledge translation dissemination checklist. And we uh, are very happy, uh, very delighted that we established the authors panel that was long uh, on our list and it's, um, it's there and it's, um, we're very happy with it. Um, and we provided feedback on the spokesperson policy, the consumer strategy paper, uh, the EMS uh, conflicts of interest workflow and also on the new strategic framework and we did that via consultation of our constituencies so what is on the what is the plan for next year um, we want to improve the council website with uh, additional discussions position papers so more activity uh, on the website um, we will keep ensuring that council is represented in the working groups and we will review and update the council terms of reference. Um, and one of the things is that we will review and have a look um, if 
if the representation that we ha currently have, if that's um, still uh, fit for purpose or that we maybe have to, uh, to add other groups or, um, or networks. Um, and last but not least, uh, very important, we will continue to work with the SMT and board on the new strategic framework uh, and the strategic monitoring and evaluation project. So if you would like to contact us, and of course we very much welcome that, um, you can visit uh, our website where you will also find uh, the agenda and the minutes, the papers, uh, and information on who is on the council and who is representing which group. Um, and before I hand uh, give the floor back to Catherine, I would like to thank um, Veronica Bonfitli, who is our administrative support. Um, Veronica, thank you very much for all the work that you do for the council. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Lucy Binder and uh, Chris Champion, who get never tired of answering our question, whether uh, big or small. So a big thank you to uh, to all of you. Um, Catherine, back to you. Thanks very much, Miranda. Um, it's been great to work with you and Craig um, over the year. Uh, we would have normally met with the council in person, but uh, we've been having um, uh, meetings every couple of months with Miranda and Craig um, just to make sure that we're connected with the council and uh, we certainly appreciate the work that you've been doing. Thank you very much. Um, it is now um, an opportunity for us to hear from uh, Mark Wilson and um, Mike will start off with his senior officer's report, CEO's report, um, and then he will hand over to Carla. So um, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Catherine, and hello to everybody. As we enter the last days of what was truly an unprecedented year, and we look back on our achievements over that year, we're also entering the last days of our seven-year strategy to 2020. And whilst we're going to do a full review and evaluation of that strategy next year, I thought this would be a good opportunity also to look back on Cochrane's achievements over the course of Strategy to 2020 and combine them together so that we can see where we've come from and what we've achieved this year in a more complete way. So Strategy to 2020 began in January 2014 and it was designed as a transformational strategy one that would take the organization into a new place ready for the 21st century. And I think we've done that. If we look goal by goal at our achievements, we can see that we've made huge strides in relation to goal one's ambition for Cochrane to produce more high quality, more relevant and more up-to-date systematic reviews. There's still a long way to go on this and a lot of improvements that we can make Nevertheless, you can see from this slide the uh, almost 3,500 additional Cochrane reviews that have been added during the course of uh, the last seven years, that we've added over a million uh, central records um, uh, during the course of the strategy, that the median time to produce a Cochrane review has fallen from 29 months to 23 months on average. And the summary of findings tables in reviews has gone from 44% of all reviews containing summary of findings tables to 92%. So almost all Cochrane reviews have a summary of findings table, a, a key quality metric that we've used over the course of the strategy. The impact of all of our work can be seen, I think, in the increase in the Cochrane Library impact factor, which in 2013 was 5.9, and now is almost 7.9. You can see the rise of that uh, impact factor in a steady way during the course of the strategy on this slide. In 2020, in relation to goal one, we have made uh, what I think we all consider to be an outstanding Cochrane response to the COVID-19 pandemic, something that Catherine has spoken about and that Carl is going to give many more details about in a few minutes. That experience has helped to inform our further development of Cochrane's editorial and production systems. And that is something that will be taken on and improved in the coming years. 
We've begun um, the critical target of implementing a new editorial management system with full rollout across all 52 Cochrane Review Groups planned for 2021. And a huge amount of work went into the development of a new conflict of interest policy for Cochrane content on the library. And that was published and took effect on the 14th of October this year. Turning to goal two, to make Cochrane evidence accessible and useful to everybody everywhere in the world. This is an, a goal in which we can be truly proud of the giant strides that we've taken thus far. We've now seen record levels of users of Cochrane Evidence around the world. We've built the foundations of a true knowledge translation oriented organization, and we've made our evidence open and accessible to billions more people through translations and our open access policy. This graph shows that transformation in stark detail. In 2013, there were 4 million visits to our evidence on the Cochrane.org website. This year, that's uh, until this date, 80 million. A huge difference. Those very positive indicators can be seen in other uh, dimensions of our uh, outreach. Cochrane Library PDF downloads have increased from just over six to just less than 12 million in the last seven years. The number of open access reviews uh, available to anybody anywhere um, has gone from a negligible percentage, around 0% in 2013, to 70% at the end of 2020. The number of translated abstracts and plain language summaries has increased from 11,500 in five languages to uh, nearly 34,000 in 12 languages at the end of this year. And the impact of that can be shown in the percentage of people who are coming to Cochrane.org and using non-English language browsers. In 2013, that was only 6%. Now, 83% of people are accessing Cochrane.org from non-English language browsers. That means that through the course of the strategy, we've truly transformed Cochrane into an organization that speaks to the world, often in their own languages. In 2020, the plain language summaries pilot, um, which is transforming the way that we make that uh, our evidence is easily available to th those who want to access it, um, has begun. And we're going to complete that pilot next year. Huge strides were made in, in other areas of our knowledge translation work. A dissemination checklist was completed and published, and the first um, uh, learnings and, uh, and trainings were, were, were made across the organization. A new learning manual was launched for, for KT, and a new KT mentorship scheme successfully piloted. Significant additional resources were, were continued to, to be made in relation to our multilingual translations of evidence and KT outreach, so that um, uh, three languages in particular can, uh, can be integrated into the, the, the Cochrane Library in the near term future. We made a major new snapshot evaluation of our COVID-19 work so far, which will, um, uh, which will inform and help to, to adapt uh, our COVID-19 response in the next year. The only thing that was postponed from our targets was our open access consultation, which was postponed until 2021 because funders and other key external stakeholders were otherwise engaged with their, co their own COVID-19 response. Turning to goal three, where we aimed in strategy to 2020 to make Cochrane the home of evidence to inform health decision making. I think we're aware that this is a, a, an area where we didn't make as much progress as we hoped. And this is going to be a continuing uh, and important focus for Cochrane in the next decade. Nevertheless, we've got huge uh, progress to, to, to show. Um, the new Cochrane brand was launched in 2015. We delivered an enhanced Cochrane Library platform, um, which has, has become much more um, available, accessible and intuitive for, for users of, our, um, of the library. We've significantly increased uh, Cochrane's profile globally, and in part due to highly successful partnerships with many, uh, many organizations, including WHO and Wikipedia, 
that remains the uh, the most accessed health information source for, for the world's population. We launched the successful Global Evidence Summit in 2017 as a premier evidence event. And whilst the, its 2021 uh, Guest 2 equivalent has had to be postponed, we're, we're hoping that that will take place now in 2023 with our partners, the Gin, Campbell and JBI. We've also built stronger advocacy and representational profile on relevant issues through, for instance, our involvement in all trials, uh, the, uh, the development of a new reward prize, um, which uh, helps to uh, ensure uh, that, uh, that research waste is limited. And we've spoken regularly at WHO assemblies. All of those three elements came together in our statement this year to the 73rd World, World Health Assembly, where we uh, made a statement that, that pointed out that billions of dollars will be wasted on the COVID-19 response unless accessible trial data is made available globally and proper synthesis and appraisal is conducted. Turning to goal four, there are ambitions to become a diverse, inclusive and transparent organization that's effective in all that we do and sustainable to allow us to meet our ambitions in the next decade and beyond. We've had tremendous success. Every area of, uh, of, of this uh, goals, uh, objectives have been achieved in relation to a transformed governance world, in, in the ways that we manage ourselves, and critically, in opening Cochrane up globally for new members and supporters and transforming how we support and develop them. This week, I'm proud to say that Priscilla Verdusco from Mexico became Cochrane's 100,000th registered member or supporter. An ast astonishing uh, transformation for the organization. In two years since membership scheme was launched in 2018, we've increased the number of supporters from uh, just over 40 to 80,000. A tremendous achievement of which I'm very proud. We're hoping that yet more people will join Cochrane and we've changed our Join Cochrane pages to allow individuals to participate, to connect and learn in easier ways. We've developed specific pathways for patients or carers or, and students uh, to, to be, be able to join us and to be able to make a contribution to our work. That contribution can now be monitored on a day-by-day -day -day basis through the new My Account pages. And individual members can view their contributions and download their membership or support, supporter badge and certificates at the press of a button. But the global reach of Cochrane is not just in relation to the huge expansion of individual members and supporters. It's also reflected in the global expansion of Cochrane's groups. This slide shows only in 2020 the new geographic affiliates that joined Cochrane or whose work was expanded. The, the new Cochrane China network will be officially launched in January, but it's been working for over a year now and expanding its work across China. There have been new geographic groups that have um, uh, established new affiliates in 2020 in Italy, Colombia, Argentina and Mexico. New geographic affiliates in new countries uh, uh, pr promoting Cochrane in new places um, have been opened in Greece, Romania and Paraguay. And associate centres have been uh, upgraded to full centres in Portugal, in Sweden and Nigeria. That growth in Cochrane groups has not just taken place geographically, but is reflected in the expanded work of uh, Cochrane groups of different kinds around the world. We've also this year, as you've heard already, uh, um, finished the negotiation and signed a new publishing contract with Wiley, which gives Cochrane tremendous financial security for the next decade. I'm enormously proud of the, uh, of, the, of the negotiated deal that we've managed to make with, with Wiley, our long-term publishing partner. And we believe that this gives us a, a secure foundation to move forward and to achieve more and more with the Cochrane Library and with the publication of our evidence. 
this table of metrics shows uh, some of that expansion and the fact that our total income as an organization has, has more than doubled from four million pounds in 2013 to 9.1 million uh, projected at the end of this year. And our, our reserves, which you've heard already, um, have also grown substantially from three million pounds in 2013 to 10.3 million pounds in 2020. And that give us a, gives us a real base to navigate the uncertainties that undoubtedly will exist for the organization in the coming years uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward, attempt to achieve our new strategic ambitions, uh, but also uh, keep enough finance uh, back so that it can help us in, uh, uh, in the way that we may, might need to navigate difficult seas. So what's that future going to look like? Well, as we've been speaking already in this meeting, we're working together on drafting our new strategic framework. I, I want to thank all of you who have contributed comments, suggestions and ideas um, to the new strategic framework in recent months. We're currently considering all of the feedback. In fact, we had so much that we delayed the further development of the, of the framework so that we could go through it and make sure that the next iteration is as comprehensive and compelling as it can be. We're, pro we're providing that draft to the governing board in early uh, 2021, and we hope that uh, soon after we'll be able to share that with the whole Cochrane community and complete and launch uh, the strategic framework by the end of quarter one at our uh, governance meetings that are being held virtually next year. In Cochrane's next decade and in that strategic framework, we will be driving forward those, um, those goals uh, and much of the work and transformational change that we've already been working on in strategy to 2020. But the strategic framework will allow us to set um, shorter term three to five year objectives with associated activities that allow the organization to flex and change over time, allow us to be agile, to, um, to new needs and new developments that take place. And of course, COVID-19 gives us a perfect example of the kinds of unexpected events that, that will um, need uh, us to adapt to them in a flexible way. So we will deepen and extend the organizational transformation of Cochrane that we've already achieved through strategy to 2020. We'll continue to make major investments in people, process and technology to ensure that we're future proofed. But we will be focusing and concentrating those investments on, on um, the ways that we can maximize the value for, for money that they give to us as an organization. We're going to be concentrating on responding to user needs, making sure that we're an organization that is truly uh, focused on the outside in, uh, not the inside out. We want to make our evidence accessible to, uh, to more and more people globally. And we want to focus everything that we do on the impact that it makes on our health decision, on health decision making around the world, the essence of our mission. So for 2021 and beyond, um, we have uh, established three major priorities for the coming years. These are, are, are the priorities which are going to lead us in relation to our, 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 our production uh, decisions, our resource decisions um, and our activity decisions so that we ensure that we do achieve these priorities and, and uh, allow Cochrane to be ready for all that lies ahead. First, therefore, we're going to continue to improve how Cochrane's reviews are produced, completing the implementation of the editorial management system, uh, establishing a new pilot demonstration project, uh, which is separating the editorial and production functions in Cochrane review groups to allow us to, um, uh, to, to do those two functions much more, um, much more effectively and cost efficiently in the future. As part of that, we'll be building up the centralized editorial service that was uh, developed in over the last 12 months to, um, uh, to support our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and we're going to develop a much more integrated editorial technology and product development process for Cochrane to better unleash the underlying potential of the tools, data and syntheses that we make. We're going to scale up the reach and impact of Cochrane's knowledge translation activities, as I've spoken about, to really main, uh, mainstream them and embed them in the whole organization so that all of us feel comfortable and confident about uh, uh, making a contribution to our KT work. We're going to invest in initiatives that will promote and deliver longer term fi financial sustainability for Cochrane, focusing on those areas that really do generate value for those who pay subscriptions to the Cochrane Library or who are willing to support our work in one way or another. We, of course, have to ensure that we maintain Cochrane's high impact COVID-19 evidence production um, and its translation into health policy and practice in the coming year. We, we're going to launch Cochrane's new strategic framework, as I've mentioned, and linked to that, we're going to establish a new organizational monitoring and evaluation framework that, that will allow us to, to manage, monitor, and respond to, um, to changes and ensure that we are meeting our declared goals and objectives. So, to conclude, at the end of a truly unprecedented and extraordinary year, I think I, and I'm sure many of you, are very tired, but I hope also very proud of what we've accomplished. Despite the extraordinary pressures and limitations affecting every one of us, despite the restrictions and extra demands affecting our personal lives, our professional work for Cochrane and for others, our travel and engagement with other people, with colleagues and friends and family around the world, Despite all of those restrictions and problems, our collaboration has never been more dynamic, more impactful, nor more recognized. And looking forward, despite the uncertainty and fears for the future that I'm sure we all have, I believe that the Cochrane community has never been so large, never been so well equipped to grow and thrive in the new world that the COVID-19 pandemic will give us. I hope you feel the same. I hope you feel tired, but also proud of what we have achieved together. I want to thank you for all of your efforts, for all of the contributions that collectively have made this an unprecedented year, not only globally for the world, but also for Cochrane. We can look forward with pride, with excitement and with anticipation that we can um, take Cochrane to, to the next level, to meet its new strategic ambitions and become an organization that is ever more impactful in the world. Thank you. I'm now um, delighted to introduce Carla Suarez Weiser, uh, Cochrane's editor in chief, who is going to present um, her uh, reflections on 2020. Thank you all, everyone. I want to thank you all for, I mean, it's amazing to have over 300, maybe 350 people uh, listen to this report. And, uh, and uh, um, so wherever you are, and I know that for some of you, it's probably mid of the night, we do appreciate that you bear with us here. Um, this has been an unprecedented year. And in fact, the Oxford Dictionary has chosen this word as the word for 2020. But for us also, it has been an unprecedented editorial uh, year for editorial achievement. And we're all very proud and very, and I hope you are as well, for everything that we have done. We have done it because we work it together. And uh, for many of us that have been in Cochrane for many, for, for many, many years, this is something that really came through throughout this crisis. We work together, we identify the barriers, and uh, we helped each other to be able to achieve what we wanted to achieve. We also kept our strive for high quality evidence. Uh, many of members of my team have reminded me many times during this process the importance of balance, quality, and speed for publication, even during the, con the COVID pandemic. So how we do we've done that, we worked with you. We create ways to provide methodological support. We were very clear regarding quality assurance 
and providing a rapid response working with our stakeholders. And the result of that were very visible. We had uh, 23 uh, re re reviews published related to COVID. Two, another two will be published tomorrow. Uh, we had eight special collections that have been uh, used widely and worldwide. We have also, uh, as were reflected before, uh, citizen scientists helping us identify the, the studies. We created a spe specialized study register and, uh, and we were producing and, and translating these evidence in ways that are more accessible, but also in certain different languages. But I think that's not, uh, you know, all. And so a couple of months ago, some members of my team, we had a meeting and we decided that it was important to put together a supplement of the Cochrane Library that reflect on and, and show examples of the collaboration that went through in the in the organization i hope you had the chance of seeing the supplement uh, but it's by no means a small task it's a solid performance in an unprecedented year and the the thing that i'm more proud of is that this has not been uh, although the year has been very very challenging for many of you and many of us uh, the impact that this had on the production of systematic reviews was really minimum. We produced nearly the same amount of reviews in 2020 that we produced in 2019. This is really thanks to our community, thanks to our groups, and for you, each one of you that had the ability and, and put your efforts together so that we could uh, continue to increase the evidence synthesis that are uh, important for our stakeholders. And obviously, this has buried fruits. Uh, as Mark alluded before, in a lot of ways, the, you know, in terms of the, the goal one. But really simply, we have now a Cochrane Library that is both in English and in Spanish. We are the third highest cited medical journal in 2019. And the Cochrane database of systematic reviews ranked 10 out of the 165 journals. Another important measure is that our reviews are becoming much more complex, but also including much more uh, studies. So on average, in, in 2016, we had 13 studies, and now we have around 19 studies per review, with many of them with much more studies included. And this obviously also is reflected on the, on the usage of the Cochrane Library. In 2019, uh, in 2020, we had nearly 12, 000, 12 million people viewing our full text of our reviews. And, uh, and, and this is also representing uh, an uh, increasing number of people from Spanish speaking language looking at the Cochrane Library, uh, the Biblioteca Cochrane in Spanish. So our impact factor continue to raise and it's now of 7.89. And this, um, I, but what is very interesting as well, I just last week have done a search of the past two weeks. And what you see is that the reviews that are published are relevant, are important questions, and are different types of reviews. So in the past two weeks, we published intervention reviews, we published diagnostic reviews, we published network meta analysis and methodological reviews. Well done. It is really a major achievement. Uh, and we worked with our stakeholders as well. So we've worked very close with the World Health Organization and we responded promptly to important uh, uh, discussions. For example, like the decade of health aging. So uh, tomorrow, the Cochrane Library app we wish will be a special issue with certain reviews related to the, the, to the decade of health aging. So responding to the needs of our end users is and will continue to be at the heart of what we do. Um, and basically, 
one of the things that uh, was very interesting to hear is that uh, the Wiley uh, team has put together a survey of uh, users of the Cochrane Library. And in this server, two thirds of people were very satisfied or satisfied with the Cochrane Library, would come back to see, to, to visit the Cochrane Library, and also would promote the Cochrane Library to their colleagues. So it's, a, it's an achievement that is really a result of your work and our collaboration. Thank you very much. Um, this means that we have uh, looked at what we've done and we have learned lessons when we intend to highlight and strengthen uh, the review production going forward. As Mark mentioned, we're looking at uh, the strategy uh, post-2020 and ways that we can actually support the community to continue to produce high quality reviews that are important for policy make for the decision making. So uh, part of what will be prioritizing this year is the implementation and rollout of our new editorial management system, enhancing the support to editorial process and prioritize development of tools and guidance to help authors and to help groups with uh, reviews in public health. This is not a small task, it's, uh, and I know it will demand a lot of communication and collaboration, yet increasing number of, of discussions. So we are putting together a plan and uh, we'll continue with the, the webinars, the Editing Shift webinar, every first Thursday of the month, and we're putting together a plan with clear timelines on when we are providing information and how you can participate in the discussion if you are part of any, any review production, being in the review groups, but also authors, editors, or other members of the community. And I want to say a huge thank you uh, what we've done this year was not a small achievement, and we've done it because we worked together. I'm very, very pleased and proud of uh, being leading the editorial side of, of Cochrane, and I'm very pleased and proud of working with each one of you. Please continue to engage with us, and, uh, and hopefully in 2021, will uh, be able to, to respond to your queries and, and continue the engagement. And part of what I'm proud of is actually the community. And as, uh, and as a continuation of my presentation, I'm very pleased to let you know that uh, we, we, we created an award, an Emeritus Coordinating Award, to acknowledge the contribution of many of our coordinating editors, many of them founders of groups that have retired this year. So each one, each coordinating edge that has been has retired this year has been offered the award, and most of them accepted it. So congratulations to all of them. Coordinating editors are really a key uh, leaders of the Cochrane Review groups. They bring a unique perspective in terms of methods and content expertise, but they also increase the profile of Cochrane in their areas of work. Uh, and we are very, very grateful to, uh, for the work of them. And as I said, many of them for many, many years. So I just wanted to give you a snapshot of who they are. And you can hear more in the website cochrane.org it is the first the, 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 the first news today in the website. So the first one I would like to congratulate is Anne Schilder. Anne is the coordinating, uh, was the coordinating editor for the Ear, Nose and Throat, and is now the coordinating, uh, the, the Emeritus coordinating editor. The next one is Bern Richer. Bern was the coordinating editor of metabolic and endocrine disorders. Chris Cates from Cochrane Airways, and for many of you will, will uh, have uh, learned a lot, like myself, from Chris, 
because he was also a, 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 an important person uh, training other authors in, in Cochrane Reviews. Chris Eccleston from Papas. Chris also was one of the founder members of the, of the Papas group. Helen Worthington from the Cochrane Oral Group, Oral Health Group. Jim Nielsen for pregnancy and childbirth. Jim was also a, a member, a, a chair of the steering group and has been involved in Cochrane from the beginning. Uh, and Richard Wormwald from the Eyes and Visions group. Thank you all very much for that. It has been a tremendous pleasure to serve you and, and to work with you over these years. And uh, please visit the, pro the, the profiles and look at what uh, their challenge for us to going forward in the community.org uh, website. Thank you very much. I think I should be passing on to Catherine. Thank you very much, Carla. And thank you to Mark. Um, I think um, the um, presentations you just gave um, really uh, knock the socks off um, what has been a really tough year. Uh, but to think of the amazing achievements that um, the uh, CET and all of those of you who contribute to Cochrane have um, managed to achieve under quite extraordinary circumstances, I think is um, uh, a, an incredible credit to you and um, it, it is a great honour to be able to serve you. Um, so uh, it, it's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Carla mentioned that it was a solid performance, but actually I think it was probably a stellar performance. And um, we would be uh, now um, very keen to hear from you to find out what your um, experiences have been this year and to ask us any questions. Now, Chris, um, we've got a few questions there. Can I just check in with you to see um, what uh, questions we need to answer first? So just by way of reminding to everybody, um, so there's a couple of ways that you could submit your questions. There's a questions panel down the bottom. So if you send those questions in by text, then we'll, we, we'll um, Catherine and Tracy can take those at this point. Or if anybody wants to be unmuted, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. So at the moment, um, Catherine, Tracy, we're just waiting for some questions to come in, I think. I think most of the ones that we received have been um, responded to directly. So while we wait for uh, questions, could we just do a reminder that uh, for anyone who hasn't yet voted, um, if you could just go over to the website and cast your vote, that would be um, very helpful. Uh, and um, I see that Sarah Yaron um, has already made a really um, lovely comment. She said she's so proud to belong to this community. Thank you, Sarah. That's great. Um, Brian has also asked um, who is identified as the user group. Um, I'm not quite sure whether you mean um, a beneficiary, uh, but uh, certainly we do have um, uh, beneficiaries um, as a charity. And this is a topic that I know Tracy likes to talk about. Thanks very much, uh, Catherine. So yes, um, as we're a, a charity, um, our um, articles of association and our uh, purpose is to serve our beneficiaries. And of course, the beneficiaries are members of the public uh, and improving um, health for everyone. So it's um, it's fantastic that we have so many people involved in Cochrane and of course we have our Cochrane Consumer Network who are uh, very valuable in providing uh, us with a grounding uh, in our thinking uh, and also um, helping to um, translate the information back uh, into inf um, ways that are more understandable for people but also trying to uh, help us with prioritising the uh, the questions that we wish to answer and making sense of that evidence itself. 
Um, so we thank our uh, Cochrane community uh, and the uh, Consumer Network for their valuable help with that. And I hope that that answers your question. Um, could I just also say we've had a comment in from uh, Stefano Negrini and um, just saying that today is Cochrane Rehabilitation's fourth birthday. Um, so can we wish uh, Cochrane Rehabilitation a happy fourth birthday uh, and just congratulate them for all they've achieved during this uh, short time. Um, they've been a very active um, uh, field in Cochrane. So thank you to everyone on the team there. Um, there's another question that's just come through um, about whether there's any plans to change the methodology of Cochrane reviews. Carla, would you like to make a comment on that? Thank you, Stavros Kakos, from ask, for asking the question. I don't know exactly what you mean about changing the methodology, but what we are really keen is really to respond to the need, needs of end users. And we've heard, for example, during this past year with the pandemic, that the end users uh, need different types of reviews. So we, we are very proud of, of the standards that we take, and I think this is very important for Cochrane. But we're also going to look at ways that we can innovate, but bear in mind that our key role is to respond to the needs of the relevant, with relevant questions, respond to these questions using the methodological uh, standards that we set for ourselves. Um, and Carla, while you're there, um, Wissam Akram has also asked about whether we can use university performance and teaching uh, how to do meta-analysis? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask that we will uh, come back with a proper answer uh, after the meeting, because I think there are other people that will be better to answer this question than me. But uh, there are, uh, we have a, a learning uh, uh, tools and we have uh, produced quite a lot of information. We're working on ways that uh, I, I understand that you were saying about universe performance. I, I believe you were talking about accreditation or something like that, but I'm gonna have to come back with you for, with a proper answer on that. Okay, and we're going to put some um, uh, answers to any other questions um, up on the AGM website um, in the next couple of days. Uh, Catherine, excuse yeah. me, if I, can, uh, if I can jump in. As a CEO, I'd be remiss if, if I, uh, you know, I, I didn't say to, uh, uh, to, to, to Wizam uh, and, to, and to all of you uh, that uh, we have a Cochrane Interactive Learning uh, uh, set of modules. We, we launched a new module in that, uh, um, in that uh, well, basically cutting edge uh, uh, course that we sell. And so we're, uh, we're encouraging universities around the world to use, uh, uh, to use that Cochrane Inter Interactive Learning uh, uh, course to, uh, for their students uh, of, of, of all kinds. And um, so I, uh, I hope he can persuade his, um, his university to, uh, uh, to subscribe. <laughs> nice there you are. There. I said there were people that could answer better. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Okay, uh, any other questions? Because um, we do have a very exciting award, the Chris Salagi Prize, coming up to announce. Um, but we would like to answer all your questions. If you um, have any more, please just type those in. I should say that Chris Watts has also provided a link to the uh, Cochrane Interactive Learning in the chat box. So for anyone that wishes to uh, to look at that, then that's now available. Um, we had a question as well from uh, Ruth Foxley, um, saying, would it be possible when proposing changes to the Articles of Association to provide an explanation of why these changes are important and how they contribute to the good governance of the organisation, rather simply stating what the changes will be? Uh, my understanding from that, Ruth, is that there is a document available um, on the uh, website um, for the AGM that has uh, information 
pertaining to that. Um, Lucy, perhaps you could uh, give us some additional information and clarification on that. Sure. Um, so uh, let me just turn my camera on. On the agm.cochrane.org website, we've provided a summary of the rationale for the main changes. A lot of what we've done is tidy up the versions between 2016 and now. So we haven't explained all of those. But in the um, on agm.cochrane.org, there are hyperlinks to the track changed version. So you can see exactly what has changed between the old version and new version as track changes. Thanks very much, Lucy. Um, so we've been asked if we have plans to make Cochrane reviews available in developing nations for free, and we have a very nice answer for that. Mark? We do, which is that we, we do that already. Um, in that Cochrane um, uh, has, a, in a sense, a unique setup in that we, we take the, um, uh, the, the, the countries listed by the World Health Organization, so therefore a complete, completely uh, you know, independent uh, judge um, of um, uh, the, the, what are called Hinari list A and B, which is a list of low and middle income countries um, uh, according to a set of economic and social criteria that WHO applies. Um, and uh, they then make, uh, um, through agreements with publishers, uh, through the Henari library system, um, uh, journals free for, for those countries. But it's a bit of a faff, a bit of a, a, bit of a task to, um, uh, to, to go through the Henari uh, system. So what we do as the Cochrane Library is not uh, make our reviews available uh, free for everybody in, in those countries, uh, though we do, um, but we make it directly available through our own system so that if anybody goes to Cochrane, uh, Cochrane Library and they are in those, those countries in Henari list A or B, and then they can access the whole of the, of the library and all the resources there for, for free. So that's something that we do already, and we have no uh, plans to, to, to change that at the moment. Um, and that means um, at the most recent uh, calculation, was that around 3.6 billion people around the world uh, can access through that facility uh, Cochrane Library reviews uh, and indeed the whole Cochrane Library for, for free and, uh, for, uh, and have one click access to it. And of course, all of our COVID-19 resources are freely available to everyone in the world. Um, we've also been asked a question about uh, what are Cochrane's efforts towards helping those who lack funds to get published, um, say if they want to publish but can't do so because of lack of funds. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether that's... Um, kind of information that uh, we do offer quite a lot of support. We don't, we, we don't offer fundings for publishing reviews, but we offer quite a lot of methodological support. And also we are working towards uh, creating ways that people can apply. Uh, and, 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 and as Mark mentioned before, the learning, uh, if you are an author, you, are, you have the, the, the ability of using the interactive learning. Um, now we have one other question about the fifth episode of Evidence uh, Essentials being published. Um, is there a quick answer to that? Because we do have a very exciting prize to award. And I don't want people to leave. Do you know about the fifth, epi fifth edition of Evidence Essentials, Carla? What was that? I don't have an answer, but again, th those are things that will be uh, putting the answer back uh, in the website and collecting all the questions that have not been answered and, and put in and, and look for the answer and come back to you. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that covers most of the points, um, including Amna's um, question about the uh, plans for full text PDFs. Um, so, it is my pleasure now to talk about the um, final prizes. Um, now we're not going to be awarding the reward prize unfortunately um, due to the impact of COVID-19 and the Thomas Chalmers Award um, is not going to be awarded this year either because that's usually given at each Cochrane Colloquium to the principal author and the best both of the best oral and best poster presentations. But 
we do have the Chris Salaji Prize. And um, it is a great honour for me to be able to um, give this prize. Uh, having met Chris, um, I was very impressed and touched by um, him. I know how uh, dedicated he was to Cochrane and enthusiastic. Um, and his uh, boundless enthusiasm um, for evidence-based healthcare is just, um, uh, it's lovely to see it. Uh, being viral all these years um, after his passing. And it is a great pleasure for me to be able to give this award to someone who is also full of uh, enthusiasm and uh, has given a tremendous service to Cochrane. And um, I am delighted to say that Joy Oliver is the winner of the um, Chris Salaji Prize this year. Um, Joy's colleagues describe her as committed, capable, passionate, and always working to ensure that Cochrane South Africa, Cochrane Ac Africa, and Cochrane succeed in all they do. Joy began her employment with Cochrane South Africa in 2000 and was instrumental in ensuring the Cape Town Cochrane Colloquium held in October of that year was an enormous success. Almost two decades later, she played an active management role in hosting the 1,500 delegates at the Global Evidence Summit in Cape Town, which was fantastic. Uh, Joy is a past chair of the Cochrane Consumer Executive, and that's where I've had my, most of my dealings with her, and she's been fantastic. And between 2003 and 2015, Joy was the HIV Clinical Trial Search Coordinator. She is a generous organiser of the HIV Mentoring Programme, and there would be few of any Cochrane Review authors in the African region who don't know her. Joy personifies the spirit of collaboration that underpins Cochrane, and it is a personal pleasure to award her the Chris Salaji Prize for an extraordinary contribution. Thank you very much, Joy. Uh, and I think we have um, a small audio clip from Joy. And I know, Joy, you're online, so we're virtually waving to you. It is a great privilege and honour to be awarded the Christology Prize. For me, there is no greater acknowledgement for the work we do than this incredible award, which I will forever treasure. I would like to thank those who nominated me, to Chris's family and all those who make this award possible, I thank you. Joy, congratulations, um, and uh, we look forward to celebrating you with, with you sometime soon. Uh, now, just um, the formalities to cover off. The date of the next meeting uh, will be held sometime next year, and we can't tell you when, <laughs> but we will be in touch with you. Uh, it's been fantastic to have more than 300 people at this meeting. Um, and uh, it's been such a great success. We might do an in online one, and we might also be uh, in person. Um, now, uh, you can still vote. Um, we're going to hold that open for another 30 minutes after this has been um, closed in the next few minutes. And we'll be announcing the results by email and on the Cochrane Community website. Um, it is uh, now um, my pleasure and Tracy's pleasure to thank you all for an amazing year. Um, thank you for uh, the heart and soul you've put into Cochrane. Um, and we really appreciate um, everything that you've done. We want you to stay safe. Um, it's um, hopefully the end of the year is a time for you to have uh, a refreshing time, um, some reflections on um, the uh, gifts uh, that um, uh, we've been given this year, it's been very hard, but um, I think that uh, we have also had some um, uh, great opportunities to do some uh, work that matters um, at a time of um, international stress and pressure. Uh, Tracy, would you like to say anything as well? I would. Thank, thank you uh, to everyone. Um, you're an amazing community. We're so proud to be part of it. Um, you are fantastic. And um, I'd just like to say, everyone, stay safe. Uh, have a, a great um, 
new year and here's to 2021. Uh, I'd also like to thank Catherine for chairing the meeting today. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to also thank everyone in the background who helped us to put all of this meeting together and all the technology that goes with it. Um, so thank you to everyone. And uh, I, I think that that's um, time to go celebrate. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, we look forward to seeing you next year, hopefully in the flesh, but if not, we'll zoom in. Bye-bye.